In the last chapter, we ate and made poop, and in this chapter, we're going to filter blood and make urine. So, big misconception for me growing up was I had the idea that whatever I drank is what I peed out, and not entirely true, because anything that's not absorbed from what I drank will come out in my feces. But a lot of my water, especially if I'm dehydrated, will be absorbed um, in the small and large intestine and become part, you know, help raise my blood pressure and eventually get filtered and um, come out as urine. So we are in week 11, and this is the second half of this unit. We'll have a unit test. So we'll get through a little bit of this and then probably take a break because this chapter's quite a lot. So this is, um, like I said, chapter 20, we're looking at the urinary system, which is mainly going to deal with the kidney. This is a scanning electron microscopy uh, a micrograph of um, the kidney glomeruli. And so these are little structures that actually are where filtration occurs and you can see capillaries all around them. Now, there are some support cells and connective tissue all around, but they've removed it from the picture so that we can see the blood vessels and the capillaries that are serving these glomeruli. So we would see the glomeruli under all these little capillary beds. So what are the organs of the urinary system? Well, we've got our kidneys. Um, those are, you know, a big deal. And then the ureters, which are going to take the urine made from made by the kidney and take it to the urinary bladder. Like we saw in the last chapter, the gallbladder is for storage, and the urinary bladder is also for storage. And so while the gallbladder didn't make anything, um, neither does the bladder. It's just um, a storage sack. And then, um, of course, we get the urinary bladder. And then the urethra takes the urine from that bladder, uh, from storage, and gets rid of it outside of the body. So what are the functions of the kidneys? They actually do a lot, right? So um, they're contributing to homeostasis, which means we're keeping things relatively um, controlled, and which is kind of what the second bullet's saying. It maintains the composition, the pH, and the volume of your body fluids at homeostatic levels. It, <clears throat> the kidneys remove metabolic waste um, and get rid of drugs and toxins. They secrete hormones that help specific metabolic processes. And so here you see the kidneys um, in this drawing right here. And the adrenal glands sitting on top, we talked about those at the beginning of the semester. And then so here, if you'll follow, you've um, got your ureters leading to the urinary bladder and then your urethra that would, would expel the urine. In this picture, you can see the right kidney here and the left kidney here. The ureters go into the bladder and then the urethra would be um, inferior. So... It is a, a unique color. It has a smooth surface. Uh, it's pretty large. And the kidneys lie on both sides of the vertebral column. They are in a little depression uh, on that posterior abdominal wall. So if you have kidney problems, it, you can feel back pain. Um, another thing is if you're hit in the back, lower back, you could damage kidneys. We call this retroperitoneal. It's actually by, behind the parietal peritoneum in kind of this uh, little pocket. Your left kidney is a little higher than your right due to the liver, and it is surrounded by the renal capsule, which um, is fibrous tissue and has adipose tissue and connective tissue um, all around it for protection and support. And so here you can see the location of the kidneys. Here's a... Uh, well, let's look at this one, a sagittal view of the kidney. So you can see all these pyramids, renal pyramids that we're going to talk about. Um, the kidney is quite beautiful. If you get a good specimen and you can cut it just right, 
you see all these beautiful arteries and veins. And then here you can see a cross section into the kidneys and a little bit of the um, aorta and the vena cava that are supplying blood to these structures. Maybe recognize that thing, that other storage bladder. So what, um, what is the kidney? Well, there's a lot of parts to it. So it has a convex lateral surface, meaning that the side, one side of it caves in um, and one caves out. Sorry, the side caves out and the, the part that's medial towards the middle of your body, it caves in. And uh, there's a renal sinus, which is this chamber that depresses in. There's the renal cortex. We'll hear a lot about that. It's the outer region of the kidney and the renal medulla is the inner re region. And this is where those renal pyramids are that I mentioned from the picture. We'll see renal columns, which are next to pyramids. They're just extension of the cortex that move into the medulla. Uh, the uh, hilum, which is the entrance of the renal sinus. And then you have this renal pelvis, a funnel-shaped sac. And it's the superior end of the ureter. And you have the major calluses and the minor calluses. And pretty much these are just tubes that merge to form the other tubes. So the minor calluses are going to merge together and form the major. And the major is going to merge to form the renal pelvis. And then the renal pelvis is going to lead us to the ureter. The renal capsule, as we mentioned, is this fibrous capsule around the kidney. And the nephrons are key. So star this uh, word nephron. It is the functional unit of a kidney. And this is where urine production happens. It's at the nephronic level. And so here we can see some parts of this kidney that we were talking about. So this fibrous capsule that we talked about, um, this minor calyx and, and a few of those minor calyces um, merging to form this major calyces, which is going to eventually lead us to the ureter. And these beautiful fan-like structures are the renal pyramids and then you have these columns where this um, cortex dips down into the medulla. Um, the renal medulla is you know kind of this area where you find the pyramids at. And then we said there is some fat in the sinuses in the spaces of the kidney. What else? And the functional unit is a nephron. So if you zoom in on this pyramid, you'll see that it's actually made of a bunch of nephrons. And um, they have a lot of their parts also. So you can see that a collecting duct is going to lead to a renal papilla and um, out into this minor calyx. And then the minor calyces will fuse to form the major. And here you see the suprarenal vein and renal arteries um, supplying, right, vascular, it's, it's very vascular, supplying the blood for oxygen and glucose for these cells to do work. We are going to have a lot of ATP needed in the kidney. So as we mentioned, they regulate volume and composition of body fluids. They remove excess water and electrolytes and waste from blood. Um, we're going to get rid of that waste in the urine. They also secrete the hormone erythropoietin, which we mentioned in the first unit. That's going to stimulate red blood cell production and red bone marrow. It also secretes an enzyme called renin, and that's going to help increase blood pressure. They, uh, these kidneys produce an active form of vitamin D, and that can increase calcium absorption in your small intestines when your blood calcium is low. And if they're not functioning properly, hemodialysis and continuous peritoneal dialysis can be used to filter the waste out of the blood if you're having some sort of issue with the kidney. You can have dialysis. So there are a few major arteries of the kidney you're going to want to know. The renal artery that branches off the abdominal aorta, so the major artery leaving the heart, it's um, going to branch to the renal artery, and that enters the kidney through the hilum. Then it 
it branches off into segments called segmental arteries, which branch off again into interlobar arteries. These are going to go interlobar between lobes. So they're going between those renal pyramids, uh, kind of in the column areas. And then from the interlobar arteries, we have um, arcuate arteries or arciform arteries. And those you see arching around the renal pyramids. The cortical radiate arteries are going to branch off those. So these are the smallest and, and many branches that came from the arcuate, that came from interlobar, that came from segmental, that came from the renal, that came from the abdominal aorta. Now there are some blood vessels within the nephron itself. There's the afferent arterial, the glomerulus, the efferent arterial, and their paratubular cavities. Um, anytime you have afferent, efferent, afferent is going towards a structure, efferent is exiting or leaving the structure. So what structure are we talking about? We're talking about the glomerulus. So um, the art, this art artery branches off of cortical radiate arteries, as we mentioned in the last slide, and enters the nephron. And then the glomerulus is actually this capillary cluster, and we looked at them, that's the first picture we saw in the introductory slide. And it's um, this cluster that branches from this arterial artery, and this is really where filtration is going to occur. And then the efferent arterial merges from this, so it's exiting the glomerulus, and it transports blood that was not filtered um, by the glomerulus. So it's, the bloods just keep going. And the paratubular cavities branch off of that and surround what's called renal tubules. And we'll see all this in pictures in a little bit. I think pictures help. <laughs> so from the nephron, the blood goes into the renal vein and then leaves the kidney. And then the veins work just the same way as the arteries. The cortical radiate vein, the arcuate vein, the interlobar vein to the renal vein. There are no segmental veins, but we are eventually going to get to the vena cava. Woo! So did I tell you the kidneys are vascular, right? Lots of blood vessels here. And so, oh, I don't know. Here's this interlobar vein. I told you it's running in between these pyramids. And then the arcuate arteries and veins run around um, on the top of the, the pyramid. And I don't know, can we tell, like... I'm trying to see if this picture shows it well, but not, not really. Okay, this is a better picture. So you have your afferent arterial leading blood to the glomerulus. Here's the glomerulus itself with its capillaries. And any blood that's remaining, any blood fluid that's remaining will, after it goes through all these tubes, will exit through the efferent arterial. And so here you can see a glomerulus. It's going to be held in... A glomerular capsule, we'll call it Bowman's capsule, and then together this is called a renal corpuscle. So here's the flow chart of blood in the kidney system. Anytime you hear renal, it means kidneys. So as we mentioned, we're going from the aorta to the renal artery. The renal artery branches off into segmental arteries. Segmental arteries branch off to interlobar arteries, remember between the um, pyramids. And then those branch off into arcuate arteries that go above the pyramid, which branch into the cortical radiate artery, which now we're in a nephron, the afferent, the glomerulus, the efferent, the paratubular, uh, also called vasorecta, which lead us eventually to the arcuate vein, interlobar vein, renal vein, and finally the vena cava. So... Let's focus on the nephron, right, because that is where urine is actually being made. It is the functional unit of the kidney. You have about a million in each one of yours. So you've got about two million of these bad boys, and they're composed of two parts, the renal corpuscle and the renal tubule. So what we saw just a second ago, the renal corpuscle is really made of two parts. Bowman's capsule, which is this container, if you will, um, the space and container that holds the glomerulus, this capillary bed. So the renal corpuscle, the glomerulus, and the glomerular or Bowman's capsule. 
And the glomerulus is this capillary cluster. And so what's going to happen is blood's going to move into that capillary. And this is where we're going to start to form urine because this pressure in the blood in these capillaries is going to leak a lot of fluids into the Bowman's capsule. We, we learned that the glomerulus arises from the afferent arterial and it's eventually going to drain into the efferent, right? So Bowman's capsule is going to receive the filtrate from the glomerulus. Any fluids that come out of that very, uh, oh, what's the word? Leaky capillary bed, um, it's going to collect there in Bowman's capsule. The nephron is made of also the renal tubule. And so this is going to be a tube that extends from that glomerular capsule to the collecting duct. And so that filtrate that we got in the glomerular capsule that, that came from the blood, the pressure from the blood pushed fluid into this capsule, right, this container. And that fluid then moves to the proximal tubule, to the loop of Henry, Henley, also called the, the nephron loop. And it's going to have a descending side so the it's a loop that goes down like a reminds me of a bobby pin it goes down the descending limb and then comes back up the ascending limb and now we're at the distal tubule and that um the distal tubules will all come together to form you know this to dump their fluid into the collecting duct and that continues through the medulla and drains through the renal papilla into the minor calyx which leads to the major calyx so here's what we're talking about Here's the afferent arterial. So blood's coming to the glomerulus in the afferent arterial. And remember, um, in the arterial, afferent arterial, we've, we've got a lot of pressure here. And we're still artery because we are still moving away from the heart, right, at this point. So blood flows into the glomerulus. High, high pressure. We're squirting releasing, oozing fluids into this glomerular capsule. And then here goes the fluid out that proximal tubule. Meanwhile, the blood in this loop of tubes um, has lost fluid and is going to go out the efferent arterial. The renal corpuscle consists one more time of the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule. And this is where blood filtration of the kidney happens. And I want you to look at this closely. Notice anything different about the afferent arterial and the efferent? Can you see that? Yeah, one is unlike the other. Our, the uh, afferent is much larger. So lots of blood coming in. And then you have a smaller efferent arterial. And that causes even more pressure like to build up in the capillary bed. So it's slower to move out. And then we filtrate. And so this is what a nephron, so this is kind of what it, what it really looks like. Now, there's going to be tons of arteries and veins around this, but this is showing this afferent arterial coming in and then your efferent. Here's the Bowman's capsule, and it's going to send its filtrate through all these tubules. Here's the proximal tubule. Here's the descending loop of Henle, the ascending loop of Henle. And then we're at the distal tubule, which is eventually going to lead to a collecting duct. Um, this picture just shows things kind of stretched out a little bit. And it's showing how this peritubular cavity, uh, capillary, sorry, is becoming the efferent arterioles. And that as blood continues to flow, it's going to eventually, you know, leave this area and um, exit the, the nephron and the kidney altogether. Here's some microscopic views of the kidney. So this is found in the renal cortex. So here's where we're located. Um, and you see the glomerulus and the actual capsule where the filtrate will be found. And then here's these um, where the filtrate is going to move through, right? Um, and then here, this is looking at um, the renal medulla. So just a bunch of collecting ducts, um, ascending and descending collecting ducts of those Lupa Henleys. Or maybe Lupa Henleys, but the collecting ducts also. So here's how we make urine. 
this part right here we're going to make urine with. So the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule. So liquid in the glomerulus, waste in the glomerulus, in the blood of the glomerulus, is secreted into the glomerular capsule. It's collected there. It leaves the renal corpuscle and goes into the proximal tubule, down the descending limb of the loop of Henle, up the ascending limb of the loop of Henle or nephron loop, to the distal tube. Now we've, we're exiting the renal tubule and going to a collecting duct. All right, so that's the nephron. A bunch of collecting ducts are going to come together to form the minor calyx, the major calyx, and the renal pelvis. By the way, we've made our urine at this point. Now we're just gonna get rid of it. So minor calyx, major calyx of the kidneys to the renal pelvis to a ureter. Remember the ureter is gonna convey the urine to the urinary bladder. Here's where we're storing it. And then we're gonna eliminate it using the urethra. Awesome picture here. There are two types of nephrons. There's cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. The majority of them are going to be cortical, and they're going to be found in the cortex, which is why they're called cortical. They have short nephron loops, and so they're located near the surface, right, because they're in the cortex. Juxtamedullary, uh, juxta means to cross or go, go into, and medulla. So this is um, less nephrons, but they have really long nephron loops and they go into the medulla, which is why it's called juxtamedullary. And these are gonna lie deeper, duh, because the medulla is, is, is deeper than the cortex. Cortex is superficial. And these are important in regulating water balance and urine concentration because we have these long loops that can do a lot of osmosis. There is something called the juxtamedullar apparatus, and this is a structure that helps regulate that enzyme called renin. Remember, we mentioned that earlier that the kidney's job is to secrete an enzyme called renin. Well, the juxtamedullar uh, apparatus is what does that. And it, why? So, what is it doing? Why is it controlling the secretion of renin? Well, it's monitoring and adjusting the blood pressure in the filtrate. So this apparatus is found at a point of contact where the sending limb, remember that's the one coming up from the uh, loop of Henle, passes between the afferent and efferent arterioles. And this is where cells of both structures um, contact and they have specialized um, jobs, the macula densa and the juxta um, glomerular cells. The macula densa, densa, we'll see these are tall, closely packed cells, and they're monitoring the sodium uh, chloride, the salt concentration. The juxta glomerular cells are monitoring the blood pressure. And based on what they determine, that allows renin to be released or not to be released. That is the question. And so we're talking about... Um, in this ascending loop, there's an area where everything kind of touches right there. And so if we zoom in on that, you can actually see these juxtamedullar cells right here um, and then the macula densa cells right here. And so they're checking for sodium chloride um, and also um, blood pressure and making the necessary changes to regulate that, to, to keep the blood pressure at a homeostatic level. Now, if you get glomerular, glomerulonephritis, um, you're gonna have some issues, right? So nephritis, itis means inflammation, nephra means kidney, so this is swelling of the kidney, and then glomerular nephritis is inflammation of swelling of your glomeruli. And this could be acute or chronic, right? So there's acute and chronic. And acute says it's um, from abnormal and immune reaction, one to three weeks after uh, infected by beta hemolytic streptococcus, so bacterial infection. Uh, it doesn't have to start in the kidney, but you form these complexes and they block the glomeruli, which causes it to swell. In the chronic one, that's going to be due to some disease. And so where the nephrons are damaged, specifically the glomerulus, and your nephrons no longer work. 
All right, so let's make some urine. Well, what is urine? It's this excretion made by the nephrons in the collecting ducts, and uh, it removes waste from your blood. It's going to have, so it's going to have the waste. It's going to have excess water and electrolytes. And there are three processes of urine formation. There's glomerular filtration, which we've already kind of talked about. There's tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. So glomerular filtration is what happens in that glomerulus, um, that first capillary bed. And so water and small molecules are secreted out of the blood into Bowman's capsule and eventually will enter the renal tubules and become the tubular fluid. And now we're in these tubes, right? So what happens in this tube um, is reabsorption back into the blood um, and then secretion out of the blood. So in tubular reabsorption, we're gonna transfer a filtered substance from the renal tubules to the paratubular capillaries, the capillaries all around the, those renal tubes. And so we're only going to bring back useful stuff and the waste is going to stay in the renal tubule. Um, in tubular secretion, it's kind of the opposite. We're going to transfer substances from the capillaries into the tubular tubule. So that's going to be waste, drugs, um, any excess substances like, uh, gosh, med uh, products of metabolisms like amino acids and nucleotides and things like that. And so here's our first, capil uh, first capillary bed, the glomerulus, and the filtrate is here in the tube. And so we, we said, okay, that's filtration. Now, tubular reabsorption is where we're reabsorbing good stuff. You know, not everything that gets filtered in from the blood into this is, is bad. It's not all waste. There's water and there's ions and electrolytes. We need to get them back. And so we're going to absorb them back into the blood. And then not everything got filtered out. So there's still some crap in this uh, efferent arterial. And so we're going to secrete that into this tubule um, so that we can get rid of it in our urine. So uh, in more detail, filtration is the first step of your information. Substances from the blood move into that capsule, um, and it's very small things. Water, little bitty dissolved molecules, and some ions. The larger stuff can't leave the capillary because it's too large. The capillaries are more permeable than other capillaries because they have these fenestrae, these tiny openings in the wall. We'll see them in a second. They're like so leaky. The glomerular filtrate is what is formed as these substances come from the glomerulus, the blood in the glomerulus, into the Bowman's capsule. And this is about the same composition as tissue fluid because it doesn't have all these large proteins and whatnot. And so here's you can, you can see these holes in uh, the walls of the capillary bed called fenestrae. And um, this just allows more fluid to leave the capillary bed and move into the, become filtrate in the Bowman's capsule. So what's causing this to leave the capillary bed and go into Bowman's capsule is hydrostatic pressure. And the afferent arterial we saw had a larger diameter than the efferent. And, and so this causes resistance, increasing the blood pressure which is going to cause more filtration to occur. Uh, now, filtration pressure is equal to the force favoring filtration minus those opposing. And, and it needs to always be a positive number so that you are making filtrate. So what forces do favor filtration? Well, the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, the blood pressure that's being formed, um, one, just due to your normal blood pressure, but Two, because of this changes, these differences in our uh, efferent, afferent arterial diameters, 
increase the hydrostatic pressure found here in the glomerulus. So what doesn't help this? Well, the glomerular capillaries have a bunch of those proteins. Remember, they didn't get to leave. So you have a hypertonic solution in there, which um, increases the osmotic pressure, which might attract water to come back into the capillary. And then as that capsule, that capsule or Bowman's capsule um, fills up, it's going to have its own hydrostatic pressure um, as fluid starts to accumulate in there. But as long as, like I said, the net filtration is positive, you're going to get some filtration. And so here is what we're talking about. Um, the pressure just from the blood, more blood flowing in than, and, than being allowed to come out is just increasing the pressure here. And you've got all these fenestrae, so a lot of fluid's going to come out. Um, but you've got all these proteins in here attracting water. So some water is going to come back into the blood. And then as fluid, as filtrate fills up this, it's going to cause hydrostatic pressure out here. And so that's going to push some water out here. But um, after you do the math, we have 10, oh gosh, is this micro, I don't know what pressure this is. Maybe, um, I can't, I'm drawing a blank. I don't know what the unit is here. But it is a positive number because we have 10 units more of the filtrate coming out than we do opposing filtration. And so they can calculate their rate. And of course they can, right? So how do you know if your kidneys are messed up without getting some data? And so here uh, is the glomerular filtration rate. And this is pretty cool like to think about how much your kidneys are working for you right now every day. But your kidneys are gonna get a quarter of your cardiac output. A quarter of the blood leaving your heart is dedicated, like goes to the kidneys, and 20% of that is filtered in the glomerular cap capillary. And the adult average rate is about 125 milliliters per minute. That's 180 liters a day. That's cray cray. Um, so your blood plasma is filtered like 60 times a day. Um, your kidneys are hard at work. And so you think about when you put poisons and toxins into your system and your kidneys got to deal with that. Shame on you. Uh, don't make your kidneys work that hard, okay? Now, only a small percentage of that filtrate is actually going to form urine. We're going to try to get back as much fluid as we can and just get rid of the you know, the waste products and the drugs and the nasty crap you're putting in your body and in your blood. So what, if factors, what factors affect the GFR? Well, it's directly proportional to the net filtration pressure. So anything that changes the pressure will change the, the GFR. And one of them being changes in the diameter of either your afferent or efferent arterial would also change um, your glomerular filtration rate. And this is neat. So we talked about 180 liters a day that glomerular filtrate is made. That's a lot of fluid that's leaving the capillary beds and going into Bowman's capsule and going to those tubules. But only a little bit gets actually excreted because that means the majority of this is reabsorbed back into the blood. So what regulates this filtration, right? There's autoregulation um, that keeps it pretty constant. Um, this has to do with vasoconstriction of your afferent arterial. We said that the differences in these diameters would affect the GFR. Um, Autoregulation, <coughs> excuse me, will reduce the blood flow to the glomerulus and then so that can slow down or decrease the GFR and uh, keep the kidney functioning. The juxtamedular apparatus that we mentioned and the tubuloglomerular feedback uh, also affect the filtration rate. So an increased GFR will increase the amount of filtrate, right? Uh, the more you're doing that, the higher the rate, the more filtrate you're making. So when you have a whole lot of sodium chloride and it, the macula densa um, can recognize that, they're going to vasoconstrict, slow things down, close up that afferent arterial, and that's going to decrease your GFR back to a normal range. 
So it says certain conditions may increase or decrease this in order to maintain homeostasis. Um, and it's all about increasing um, or decreasing it due to, to amount of body fluid. Now there is hormonal control um, by our hormones that are released by our, our, our heart, our cardiac hormones. So the heart does secrete atrial uh, natriuretic uh, peptide and ventricular natriuretic peptide. And uh, those are always in response to what? Blood pressure and, and which is blood volume. The higher the blood volume, the higher the blood pressure. And so they can increase the excretion of sodium and water excretion as well. And that will, so if you have high blood pressure, we can get rid of some water and that will lower the blood pressure. But if you have lower blood pressure, we can actually stop excretion of water and that will bring your blood pressure back up. Of course, the sympathetic nervous system is controlling um, the glomerular filtration rate. Um, it says these responses, uh, these responses to changes in the systemic blood pressure also affect your kidneys. When blood pressure or volume decreases, your sympathetic stimulation causes afferent and efferent arterioles to constrict simultaneously, and this will help maintain GFR in a normal range. So moral of the story is sympathetic nervous system has some neural control over this rate for you. Um, bigger and more important to us is the hormonal control. And this is the renin angiotensin system. And this is when your blood pressure gets too low. It, of course, tells your sympathetic stem, uh, nervous system. And also the macula densa can tell that, right? That's one thing it's measuring. And then you're going to have a decrease in your sodium chloride. And that's going to cause renin to be released. Now, what does renin do? We've talked about this, that the kidneys release renin. Well, what renin does is it converts another chemical, another protein called angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. And then that's converted to angiotensin 2 by ACE. And angiotensin 2 is what causes vasoconstriction of your arterioles and secretes ADH and aldosterone. And what is that going to do? Well, that's going to make you super thirsty, retain water and sodium. And if you're retaining water, your blood pressure goes up. And so this is kind of showing like how vasoconstriction of your afferent arterial. So if you squeeze this close, it's going to decrease your rate because you're going to have less blood coming in here. Um, vasoconstriction of your efferent is going to cause more blood pressure to build. So that's going to actually increase your glomerular filtration rate. If you pinch off both of them, it's going to be a slight decrease. And if you dilate your afferent, it's going to increase. So that's just showing how these different diameters can affect your rate of glomerular filtration. So here's that renin angiotensin system. Pay attention to this, star this slide or whatever, highlight. So liver creates this angiotensinogen, but the kidneys makes renin, right? And what does renin do? Well, it activates... Um, angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. And then ACE, which is angiotensin converting enzyme, this enzyme, uh, E for enzyme, converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And what this is able to do is stimulate um, an increased ADH secretion, antidiuretic. So you're going to keep water, you're going to get thirsty, you're going to pee less, and your blood pressure is going to come up. We're going to pause here. Hey, just in time. That was my timer. So we're going to pause here and uh, start back with tubular reabsorption.